Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, it's a put a grace period of a minute after six to let latecomers come in. Um, and here comes Susan from our board. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker today, who is uh, Cole Tonemaker. And I, um, I need to mention this is part of the Rural Roots Sustainable Agriculture Speaker Series that we do nearly every month on the second Wednesday. Um, recently, it's been by Zoom, well, for the past year plus, um, and hopefully we'll get back to doing some of these in person. But this is a great one for doing um, by Zoom because Cole lives a little ways from here, so it'd be kind of a trip to come travel this far. Um, we're really fortunate to have Cole Tonemaker from Tonemaker Hill Farms in Royal City come talk to us about growing tree fruit organically in the inland Northwest. And if anyone's ever visited the Mothco's farmers market in particular, there's always very long lines. They're um, ready to, um, waiting to purchase fruit from their, from their stand or, or vegetables as well. It's not just fruit, but tonight he's gonna be talking about fruit. Um, there's apricots and peaches and apples and pears and uh, plums and pluots and plumcots and all sorts of interesting um, different fruits. And he'll talk more about some of these as we go along. Um, our Rural Roots Board Chair, um, Sylvia, is, has known Cole for quite a long time, like since maybe the 90s. And I haven't known yeah, him. Yeah, we had a... Long. We had a stand next. We had a we had a farm stand. Deborah and I had Sweet Bound Nursery, and we had a farm stand right next to Tonemakers, and so we drifted over into buying their fruit. And so now it's like on into Cole's grandchildren are now almost the age that his children were when we were first <laughs> buying fruit from them. Yeah. Um, let's see. They planted their first trees in 1967. In 1981 is when he began managing the farm using IPM. And um, in 1997, they transitioned to growing organic and they've been coming to the Moscow farmers market since 1984. So that's quite a, quite a while. He's a U of I graduate and he has definitely presented at um, other rural roots and cultivating success events in the past and he's here to share with us his 55 years of tree fruit growing experience. And I think I will be monitoring the chat as we go through this. And um, Cole would appreciate it if we did questions at the end, but go ahead and send them in on the chat um, if you have a question right away and I'll be monitoring those while, while Cole speaks. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Cole. And you could fill in any parts of that introduction that are missing. You're good to go. Well, uh, the only thing that's uh, missing is uh, my wife and I ran a track for University of Idaho and I see Maureen is there and she was uh, at one time, she worked way up to assistant athletic director and it was, it was really nice to see her there. So uh, that's where Sonia and I met and together she and I uh, built this farm from continued on from what my grandparents had started. Okay. All right, so I guess we're gonna get started with a PowerPoint. And almost all of these pictures are from our farm. And there's a few that obviously, quite obviously are not, but they're pretty easy to pick out. Everything else is from our farm. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So another thing that, um, <clears throat> you know, even though our farm is a bit uh, remote from uh, uh, Moscow, uh, both of my sides of my family, my mother and my father's family have been in the Northwest over a hundred years. And they've been, uh, both sides of the family have been involved in agriculture all the way from the uh, Nevada, Idaho border and the Oahe mountains, all the way up to the fruit growing areas on the Canadian border in the Okanagan Valley. And this is the, what I've prepared to talk about today. And as we're looking down uh, two rows of braver and apple trees that are trellised. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the history and the crops we grow and how we grow them. And then at the end, 
a little bit about uh, what I feel is sustainability. Uh, this is an aerial view of our farm. Uh, it's, it's straddled by the windbreak trees, the tall trees, and also the, the text. So everything in the middle there is our farm and we're looking down the Frenchman Hills there. These are kind of the conditions we have on our farm to grow fruit in. My grandfather picked, uh, picked this spot when it was just sagebrush. So right off the bat, we're gonna have a quiz. I thought you probably thought you were done with school, but here we go. So when I was putting the slide in the presentation, I had no intention of using it for this purpose, but I noticed that we have a number of uh, dead, uh, dead bloom here from frost damaged bloom. And I was wondering if uh, you guys might take a minute to see if you can figure out which ones of these are dead and which ones are alive. And so maybe I'll, I'll give you a couple to look at here. This one right here. Uh, if you make a note as to whether you think this is alive or dead. And this one as well. And then also this one right here. And this one right here too. So uh, the answer is the next slide. These arrows are pointing to bloom that are dead. And they look uh, pretty much uh, casually just like uh, any other bloom. But they're, uh, uh, been the female parts, which are in the center, have been killed. And we'll give uh, an idea there, right there at the end of the pointer is the female part. And that's called a pistol. The whole female part together is called a pist pistol. And that's the part of the flower that usually gets killed in the frost. Everything else around here is the male part. That's the anthers that have the pollen. So quite often you lose the, the pistol uh, and uh, sometimes just part of the pistol. The style will die or just the ovule ovules at the bottom. This right here, this is a dead bloom and you can see in the center it's it's brown in there. Now this is an example right here. It's a good place you can see the, the female uh, part is looking good there. But I guess the gist of this is that there's a lot of frost damage in the orchard this particular year and you need about 70 percent or so of the blooms to be alive to uh, produce a good crop. And just because they're alive doesn't mean they're going to get pollinated. And this good little guy here, he's got to do his job. And we're going to talk about whether he's going to get his job done uh, a little bit later. <clears throat> so I know this is the same uh, photograph as we looked at before, but without all the text in the way. And we wanted to show this again because uh, we kind of want to emphasize that when my grandparents started this farm, everything was like this. And up here, there were no, there was nothing there. There was just sagebrush and rock and no pipes, no irrigation, no field plan, no electricity. And they started it, and this was 1962. And so uh, the whole family was involved in getting started. And there was, uh, of course, uh, a lot of rock and big rock. And that's my first uh, memory of this farm. When I was barely old enough to walk, I can remember my grandfather and my father dynamiting huge granite erratics, which are boulders that left by the floods sometimes weighing 20 and 30,000 pounds and blowing them into pieces small enough that we could actually move them off the field. Of course, this work with rocking the field has been ongoing. Took this picture, we took this picture a couple of years ago and somehow I, you can tell by the smiles all around there, my boys, how happy they are to be out there. They're, uh, somehow I got them out there to uh, pick rock all day. And this is a typical, harvest rock every time we plow. And uh, so there's only really two ways to look at this according to my sons. One is that somehow I've made up this fairy tale that I've actually been picking rock out of these fields for 60 years. Or the alternative is I did a really bad job. Is there still way of too many rocks out there? And my, my feeling is that actually I've been harvesting the rocks in a sustainable method. They're gonna be there for generations to come. <laughs> so we started the farm 1962 our first part of the orchard was planted in 1967 and it was the first orchard on the frenchman hills and grandpa farmed this conventionally and he passed away in 1981 and after that i took over managing the farm and pretty quickly i started using integrated pest management which is abbreviated as ipm I don't see this use, uh, this uh, terminology used much anymore, but at the time it was gaining popularity as kind of a, 
transition from conventional uh, control, you know, pest and disease control to a more uh, uh, soft or organic type program. And in 1997, we started uh, doing, a, growing our farm, uh, all of our crop organically. Now, that means it's 25 years ago. And I, I just, I had to check the math a second time. I couldn't believe it's been 25 years, but it's been a while. So what's following in, in this presentation is my opinion and, and my, from my experience, and other farmers may hardly disagree, but they would of course be wrong, wrong, wrong. So we, we grow uh, all of these types of perennial crops uh, listed here, and it amounts to at least 250 varieties. I asked Luke this morning how many he thought there were. He's in charge of, my son Luke is in charge of deciding what we plant in the orchards and nowadays. And he said it was at least 250 as of this morning. And by this afternoon, he might have planted more. I don't know. It's hard to tell. And one thing to think about with 250 varieties is we have a harvest window from mid-June through October, which depending on the year is 130 to 140 days to harvest. And we have 250 varieties to harvest in that time. So it kind of gives you an idea of the chaos that we are in all summer long. I'm gonna look at a, a few pictures of some of the fruits we grow. One of them is a pluot, which you may or may not be familiar with, but it's a plum apricot cross. And they, the fruit and the tree will resemble what you see in plums. We found them to be pretty susceptible to winter injury, and I think they'd like it a lot better in California, but we're still trying to grow them here. Now their cousins are apricot plum cross, but in this case, the fruit and the tree resemble apricots. And we have had a little bit of trouble getting the flowers to actually set and develop into fruit, and we haven't figured that out yet. Peaches are one of our, our mainstays. It was kind of like one of the first things that got us into direct marketing. My grandparents planted trees for family and friends. And when you, my grandparents lived to be a hundred years old, then you kind of outlive all your friends and, or they decide they don't want to can anymore because uh, you know they just don't feel like doing it anymore. So we had all these peaches and nowhere to go with them. So we started direct marketing them, and then people started coming to the farm and it just kind of got to where we had people banging on the door all the time and we ended up building a fruit stand right there at the farm. We were one of the first farms in the entire Northwest to start growing Honeycrisp apples, not because we knew what they were, but it was just an absolute blind luck where we planted them in 1992. They were patented, patented in 91. These are gala apples, which had been a good crop for us, but unfortunately, uh, they have become more or less a commodity now, and which means that for a wholesale, the wholesale market, they're really unprofitable to grow, even organically, and so they're not really being planted anymore. This is a picture from inside of our original uh, little fruit stand, and uh, on the bottom right, you see some nectarines, some really pretty nectarines, as it turns out, and I'm just going to say this right out, that you just cannot grow nectarines and sell them at the, you know, through the traditional marketing chain and have them be anywhere near edible. To be good, they gotta be picked right off the tree. And, and got, I mean, they need to be tree ripened and eaten right away. And that's something we can do that the big farms can't do. And it gives us a little bit of an advantage. Sweet cherries are a crop that uh, is the crop that my grandpa really wanted to grow when he picked our farm and they have grown really well for us. There are very few cherry orchards on the north slope of the Frenchman Hills, but it, it, if you can get away from uh, winter damage, which is does happen, uh, and frost damage, then you have some a wonderful place to grow cherries and his grandpa's cherries were always one of the best, um, had one of the best returns and they were almost always um, in the export market. Okay, since you're pros now at detecting uh, frost damage in blossoms, we're gonna try again. These are a couple apple bloom and I'll give you a second to see if you can figure out which ones of these are frost damaged. So right there, 
the arrow points to the uh, dead bloom, and you can see uh, the diff one of the difference between uh, peaches, which have a single seed, a lot of all the stone fruit, they have a single stone or seed. And, then, and so they have one pistil. And the apples and pears and quince are pomaceous fruits. They have five uh, carpels and they have five seed cavities. So they have five pistils, one, two, three, four. And the fifth one is hiding somewhere among all the anthers here. But and th these are live, and you can see the difference between a live pistil and these shriveled up brown dead ones. So when you lose, lose the, the king bloom, generally is the first bloom to open and a spur, an apple spur generally have five uh, blossoms. We can one, two, three, four in the back. And this is the five. Now this may be a sixth one. Every once in a while there's a sixth one, but I think it's on a separate uh, spur. So the king bloom opens first and generally has the nicest and the biggest fruit. And so if you lose the king bloom, which we did in this case right here, then you're growing what they call a side bloom crop. And the side bloom will certainly make an acceptable fruit, generally won't be as big. One other thing I want to, when this, I see this flower, it brings to mind the bee we saw sitting on the cherry bloom and a few slides back. And I just wanted to bring up something that's disturbing about bees and that Generally, you know, we hire the bees, we rent the hives, we're actually hiring the bees, you know, and they're supposed to land on the flower right here and kind of burrow their way through all this mess to get down to the ovule where the nectar is. And in doing so, they get covered with pollen from the anthers. And when they fly to another flower and do the same thing, they bring that pollen from this flower to the other flower to, to pollinate it, and they leave the, the pollen sticks to these really sticky stigma on the end of the, uh, the pistol. So there are some bees that will actually land out here and then they will sneak up here. They sneak up here and then they stick their built-in uh, straw down in here from the side into where the ovule is and they suck out all the nice nectar and then they leave never having done their job. And these bees actually have a name for that. They call them side workers. And so even in the bee world, there are slackers. <laughs> anyway, I guess it's time to get serious. Uh, we'll talk about uh, our programs here on the farm. And I, when I see the slide, I, I always remember that every time I ask my wife to come out and help me take some photographs, she'd all, you know, it's always come up with this question of, okay, Who's sweeter, me or the apples? And if you ever had a loaded question, that is it, huh? So um, it, it, when you start growing uh, tree fruit or decide you wanna try, first you gotta figure out what species is gonna work for you uh, or you wanna try. And then a species would be like apples or pears or peaches. And then among the species, you gotta come up with a variety that uh, will, will maybe mature in the time that you have in your climate and your microclimate. And I was looking at the slide and, and trying to figure out exactly what kind this was. And Luke said, well, it's obviously, this is Diamond Princess Peach. And some of you that comes to Moscow Market may be familiar with the Diamond Princess, a very popular peach. This is uh, Grandpa's original 19... 67 cherry planting, which was his pride and joy, and it had tr produced just tremendous crops of just beautiful cherries. And then it it did succumb to over time, uh, you know, 50 years, it succumbed to uh, winter damage, a number of, of winters. And the inside of these trees were just really punky, and there was just a live, a narrow ring of live tissue around the base of most of these. So the yields started to really suffer and that some of them would blow over every year in the wind. And so it was just heartbreaking in, in 2016 to have to cut these down, just absolutely heartbreaking. But at some point, you know, I'm responsible for making the business work. And so we had to do that. So we had needed to have um, more cherries. And so how are we gonna decide on what kind of cherries we wanna plant? Because now there's a lot of different cherry varieties available. And we have a criteria for the cherries that we want to plant. And because we sell most of them direct to uh, consumers, the, the overwhelming uh, criteria is taste. And then they've got to be a, a decent size to make them economic to uh, handle, to pick and handle. 
another thing that uh, is really equally important uh, as far as growing them is a the maturity date, because we do grow a lot of varieties of cherries up to about 20, I believe. And uh, we don't want them to mature all in the same day. We would like to spread them out over almost a two month period. So we take a hard look at when they mature compared to the other varieties that we already grow. Pollination is a big concern with cherries. Uh, you need to set a lot of fruit on each inch tree, a lot of individual pieces of fruit, probably 60, 70, maybe 80% of the bloom needs to be fruit or, uh, to have a good crop, whereas like an apple, maybe 5% because the fruit is so much larger. So pollination is a huge issue with cherries. And the original uh, cherries we had on our farm and most of the old varieties uh, require cross-pollination. So you have to plant a variety that's they're pretty much strictly for pollination purposes. And that may or may not be, have any commercial value. The newer varieties, uh, a lot of them you see at the grocery store that start with an S, uh, Skeena, a Sweetheart, our example, Symphony. Those uh, all uh, come out of Summerland, British Columbia, and they're self-fertile varieties. And that's a new thing for cherries, so you don't need to have pollinators. Uh, you do need to have, um, in, for the ones that do need cross-pollination, you need to make sure you have a pollinator variety that blooms at the same time because cherries may bloom over in an almost a month uh, period. And if you have an early one and a late one, they will not pollinate each other. So the, uh, another thing we don't, we'll never do again with uh, sweet cherries is plant a full-size tree. Everything we plant on our farm now is a dwarfing rootstock. And those rootstocks will produce a tree that's somewhere between 50 and 80% of the traditional size cherry trees. And the other a good thing about a dwarfing rootstock is it tends to make the tree precocious, which means that it will bear fruit at a younger age. So when I was putting these slides together, uh, my grandson Lincoln, who's four years old, was sitting on my lap and he looked at this photo and he said, why is dad so angry? A anyway, uh, I couldn't, I didn't have a good answer for that, but uh, the one thing I did tell them is that, well, there's no really off season for us. Uh, we have to, as soon as we get done uh, picking, we're going to start pruning. And you can see the prunes on the ground here. And these, this is a D'Angelo pear uh, orchard. And the pruning is, is a just absolutely critical part of um, our growing season. It, we need to do that to renew fruiting wood. Their trees are only as old as your fruiting wood. If you have young fruiting wood, then you have a, basically you, you're fruiting, uh, you, your trees will fruit as if a young tree. You need a strong structure. These trees will hold up, you know, four or 500 pounds of fruit. So they need to be able to hold that up even in a strong wind. You need to be able to, uh, the light needs to, pen, sunlight has to uh, penetrate all the way to the, to the lower limbs, the you know, waist height where we uh, grow fruit at the lower part of the tree. You need to have, be able to grow good fruit down there. So you need sunlight to pass through the canopy. You also need good air movement, air flow, because with that you have less disease pressure. And so here, uh, near and dear to the bee people's heart is a swarm, a bee swarm on a pear limb. Now this pear tree, if you can see, there are a few petals hanging on here. So this is a, what we call petal fall timing. And most of the petals have disappeared and now you have these little pear fruits growing right here. But so the bees have been working the pollination season and they are just, uh, they've been working like crazy, except for the side workers, I will say. They've been pulling in uh, uh, lots of honey and uh, the hives gotten stronger and bigger and lots of brood have hatched and now they need a bigger home. So they swarm, it's called swarming and they'll, uh, it's kind of intimidating to see a, a swarm of bees move through the orchard. Uh, and they generally, I've never been stung by one, but it's still intimidating. So there's a, like uh, pears are an example. There's probably a, a anywhere from a five to seven day window most years when the flowers are receptive to being pollinated. And if you miss that, if the bees don't work, they get too much wind, or you don't have good uh, pollen uh, available that for the cross required cross pollination, then you don't set fruit and there's no recovering from that. That means you just don't have fruit that whole year. And so this is an absolute critical time of the year. We do irrigate on our farm. And the, the major thing to, to remember about uh, 
water, if you have the ability to control how much water your trees get through irrigation, is that you really need to balance uh, giving the tree enough water so that it remains vigorous enough to grow good, strong fruiting wood and the fruit to grow well. Without giving it so much water, you get rank, unusable uh, growth in the top of the tree that just provides shade and habitat for pests and diseases and requires just being cut off in the winter. And, I, and overwatered fruit, I think, actually has a poorer fruit quality, better, I mean, poor uh, eating quality. As far as uh, nutrition, it's, it's really the same idea as water uh, management is you want to give the tree enough uh, nutrients that it grows well, but not too well. Over overly vigorous trees uh, grow too much wood that is unusable, it has to be cut off generally at the top of the tree where it's going to shade the lower parts of the tree. You want to have good uh, sunlight all the way to the bottom so you can grow good fruit all the way to the bottom of the tree. And that really rank, fast growing, excessive uh, uh, extra growth is a, just a, a real good habitat for mildew and aphids and other kind of pests. That, that being said, you need to give it enough nutrition that uh, they'll grow a usable, good fruiting wood. All of these bloom, these are nectarines, and all of the bloom here is growing on wood that grew last summer. So every year you have to grow new fruiting wood for the following year, every single year. So you have to make, maintain enough vigor in that tree to grow a lot of new wood without overdoing it. <clears throat> These are some Braeburn apple trees, uh, blooms, and this is actually the time when we try to do our thinning. There's two main uh, objectives with thinning, and one is to uh, get the right leaf to fruit ratio. In other words, to spread the, the fruit out throughout the canopy so that each uh, apple is being fed by enough leaves so it can be a nice, uh, large, good uh, tasting, uh, good colored fruit. And the other uh, quality, which I really are uh, really important uh, idea about thinning at this time of the year, it just it's a bit of a stressor every year is to thin enough so that you have what's called resting spurs. The resting spurs are spurs like this one right down here that doesn't have any fruit on it. And that uh, it's going to rest this year because uh, it had fruit last year, probably. And next year it'll bloom. So if you don't have enough resting spurs, you will have a, a year, the next year, you're gonna have like blank uh, trees during bloom period. So you wanna even out uh, the amount of bloom from year to year. And so this is the time to do it. If you do not, uh, if you do not take off enough bloom at this period and a, and a heavy bloom, then you just won't have any bloom next year. Here's a example of a, a uh, nicely thin gala branch. And you can see that every apple, it looks like it's got decent size. It's got good color because it's got, uh, you know, exposure to the sunlight all around. And there's a nice little bit of new growth, not too much. Uh, and then there are areas where there are resting spurs here and here, and down in here. So there's places where there, there should be bloom next year. So after an entire year, harvest is the one last chance to, you have to really mess things up in the field. And so uh, it, it's just, it can't, can't be overstressed how important the, the time that you pick, the, the time you choose to harvest your fruit is. If you harvest too early, you, you're gonna have poor eating quality, which is a fancy way of saying it tastes like garbage. And if you pick too late, uh, the fruit won't, you won't be able to handle the fruit well, it won't store well at all, and it probably won't be able to be transported very well. So there's a sweet spot in, spot in the middle that you want to aim for. The ultimate decision is going to depend on how you want to market your fruit. And that is something that, uh, that really cannot be overemphasized that you need to have a plan from the beginning of the growing season, how you're gonna market the fruit. You cannot leave that to the last minute. And I have unfortunately uh, run into people who are ready to harvest fruit and they'll come to me and say, now what do I do with it? And that's just, or you just, your heart just sinks to think of uh, where the predicament they're in. 
a lot of the decisions you make during the growing season will be based on whether there's the fruit is destined for the wholesale market or the processor market or whether it's going to the farmer's market or direct to the consumer. And you need to have a plan and then you need to have backups because it has happened to us that on the day of harvest, the people that were going to buy the fruit back out. And so you're right now, you don't have time to start from scratch. You need to have a plan B and sometimes even plan C. So this is something that uh, has been a, a huge consideration uh, in the last few years is the wholesale market and which years ago, most of our fruit went into the wholesale market. And I would say that for generations, probably, you know, all, you know, well over 95% of the fruit grown in the Northwest went to the wholesale market. And that means it goes to a warehouse, which never really takes ownership of the fruit, but stores it and packs it and markets it for you. <clears throat> and they take their fees out and send you what's left. So uh, in the current situation, it's, it's hard, really hard to believe this and it's hard to believe that this is true, but it, it, you can check the facts on this and it is absolutely true that um, right now the industry uh, as a whole, they're hoping to get a return for a bin of apples. This is a bin of apples right here a return for a bin of apples that is actually 20% less than what we were getting in 1985. And that is not just a one year deal. This has been ongoing for a number of years. And, and I don't know uh, how many people think they can get by on 20% lower than they were making in 1985 in this day and age, but that's the, the situation that uh, farmers that are growing strictly for the wholesale market are in. And uh, it, it's just to the point where <clears throat> actually at some points, uh, warehouses will sell uh, the farmer's fruit and then they'll let them know that hey you know we sold your fruit and what we sold it we're able to sell it for is less than what it cost us our cost so you you have to pay up this bill and i don't know how many people uh know of a job another job where you actually produce a product and, and sell it at the market and then instead of getting paid you get a bill so that that's really where it's at and it's a very dysfunctional uh system and because of that we a long time ago decided we got to go to plan uh, B. Uh, and on top of all the issues, the economic issues with the wholesale produce, it's got to be cosmetically purpose, per, uh, perfect and it has to be large. And believe it or not, that photograph is not photoshopped. <clears throat> that uh, we grew those cherries on our farm. So we kind of went uh, almost 40 years ago um, deciding we had to take a little more responsibility for our own economic survival. And the farmer's market, and this is at Moscow, you probably recognize that, has been a huge thing for us over the years. And my brother uh, has gone to farmer's markets and sold to restaurants and places like that on the coast, uh, Washington coast for years. And that has changed everything for us. And with that, you, you don't leave it up to uh, middlemen marketers that really have no interest in seeing that you have any return at all to the farm. The thing you got to remember with that, though, is that you are face to face with those who are going to actually eat your fruit. And you have to be responsible for everything you sell to them. <clears throat> and that changes everything. <clears throat> You're not no longer putting your fruit on a truck and it disappears down the road some to some distant location where a broker is going to buy it and put it in a big chain store. You're, you're going to have the, to uh, answer for every piece of fruit. And so from variety selection to how we grow it, when we harvest it, all that is uh, a big consideration uh, when you're dealing face-to-face -face with the customer. This is our farm stand uh, we have at our farm. And we started this because people kept banging on our door wanting fruit. And I'm just still to this day amazed how many people go way out of their way to come to the farm to get fruit or sometimes even traveling hundreds of miles. And they're looking for good tasting fruit at a reasonable price and they want to know where the fruit comes from. <clears throat> All that being said about a, having a marketing plan, which is in this day and age is essential, you still have to uh, figure out how to handle the relentless assault by pests and diseases in the field. I'm going to show uh, or talk about a little bit uh, about our uh, program and thoughts about how to control pests and diseases. 
And I want to emphasize this is an ongoing uh, learning process. I've been doing this a long time, and I still uh, have years where I have feel like I have no idea what's going on out there. After World War II, uh, there became uh, the United States started producing uh, a lot of synthetic chemicals, um, insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides, miticides, you name it. Uh, and it, for people like my grandfather who had grown up in an orchard and had problems that just seemed unsolvable as like a gift from God. And they, uh, it was a miracle. And so uh, there became a culture uh, for a number of uh, several decades where uh, it was there was a thought that you could do, deal with any issue uh, on the farm in the orchard, perennial orchards, with um, chemicals of one form or another. And I think that uh, my personal opinion is that yeah, I understand where that came from, but I also feel it has failed, and I think we need to move beyond that. And I, one thing I, that's kind of important to me, I, I really feel like we shouldn't judge the past generations for grasping onto something that seemed like a miracle cure to them at the time. I, as a 15 year old, I, I realized that I could never understand uh, where my grandparents came from. I could never put myself in their shoes or, or live the experiences they lived. I, my grandfather's, uh, his father, my great grandfather, uh, it started an orchard in the Yakima Valley in 1903 and they lived in a tent and they put the tent up against the side of a cliff and dug into the cliff and they, into a cave and that's where they lived. And they used lead arsenate to control worms and the, and the apples. And if the apples got wormy and they would rot from the inside out, they had no food for the winter. And then my other grandpa who herded sheep in the Oahe Mountains, he he told me that, or he told the, the family that he lost 800 head of sheep one night when they, um, the snow uh, melted, got slushy, and then they sat down in it, and then they froze to the ground at night, and they couldn't get up. And 800 in one night, and the coyotes and the cougars were continual menaces. And I had an uncle who was born in a tent in the mountains in the, in the sheep camp and another uncle who told me his overwhelming memory of childhood was being hungry. And so I, I can never even understand how they felt. And so I don't wanna judge their reliance on chemicals, but I just think we need to, to move past that now in this day and age. I think we need to learn how to use the advantages that nature gives us and deal with, and, and use those advantages to and opportunities to deal with the challenges. And it's not easy and it's not simple. So uh, organic uh, control strategies are really different depending on whether you're dealing with a direct uh, pest or an indirect pest. Uh, direct pests uh, damage the fruit directly. They feed on it or they, uh, make it unmarketable uh, directly, and, or they may just flat out kill the trees. Indirect pests in orchards generally will feed on the leaves, and in high populations, they they uh, can damage fruit uh, directly, or they can, um, you know, hurt the trees so bad that your fruit uh, suffers. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I can't even look at this direct pest without deal without thinking about my brother-in-law, but that is a whole nother story. We're not going to get in that today. Uh, so anyway, we're back to our, our slide with the cherry blossoms. And you know what? I, another thing I have a hard time looking at is that bee thinking, I wonder if that guy is a side worker or if he's really helping me out. I wonder about that. He Look where he's standing. He's trying to get on the side. I can see it. <laughs> so anyway, this uh, this idea here uh, on this slide is, is simple enough, but uh, to read. But really, uh, what the heck does that mean? Uh, natural or with the proper timing. Uh, so, with that in mind, um, I wonder if anybody can uh, 
tell me why winter is our greatest ally. Uh, that maybe uh, I heard several people at Moscow last weekend say that they are totally ready for winter to end right now. And we're only not even halfway through January. So um, as an organic farmer, uh, I have to be a spoil sport and say that we winter is our, our biggest friend. And I think anybody that probably has spent a lot of time in a greenhouse that operates year round can can answer this question. And that the answer to it is that winter does something that we don't have any other way to do. It synchronizes uh, pest populations at the overwintering life stage. Well, life stage uh, in insects, of course, it could be eggs, larva, nymphs, pupas, or adults. In most cases, insects will only survive the winter in one of those stages, often in an adult, sometimes eggs, sometimes pupa. And so we have an opportunity that is a once a year opportunity in the spring to have all of the individuals of a, uh, of a pest population at the same stage. And most of the organic control methods are uh, will only work on one of those life stages. So it's just a critical time of the year for pest control if you're an organic farmer. <clears throat> By summer, there will be all, all those generate all those life stages will be present at the same time. And if you don't only eliminate one, you're just like the Dutch boy putting his finger in the dike and hoping it doesn't uh, break before the end of the harvest. So uh, there are degree day models that uh, uh, extension and uh, other people keep, and that generally uh, has to do with the temperatures after January one, and you can use those. It, to predict uh, when uh, trees are going to bloom, when pests are going to emerge, when you have threats of uh, disease. And as good as those models are, and as much work has been put into them, we still every year need to adjust them by figuring out when biofix is. And biofix is when you actually see evidence in the field. <clears throat> Such uh, an example would be a coddling moth that makes wormy apples when we first catch the first adults in the traps. And that tells us that it gives us a day and a time when the adults are flying. And so from there, we can continue to use our, uh, can, to accumulate growing degree days and uh, predict when they'll have egg lay and when the eggs will hatch and when disease threats will come along. So this is a this is another very important uh, part of organic uh, farming is that you have to be on your pest problems early in the year because by summer there will be multiple uh, life stages of every pest that has more than one generation in the orchard at the same time and you won't be able to control those. <clears throat> and the same is with diseases. You you just uh, you have to be on them right from the beginning because by the time you get to summer they'll be out of control. You just have to get through harvest before they just take over the orchard. <clears throat> this is an example of a coddling moth trap that we use to for biofix and to monitor the population during the summer. Uh, there's a pheromone uh, lure right here. And that has the female pheromone in it and it attracts these are mostly males, most likely, and they are attracted by the female scent and they get stuck in the sticky uh, here. And if you have more than two, one, two, in your trap for a week, you generally have an issue you're gonna to have to deal with. And this guy's got a real problem right here. Uh, other insects that aren't as easy to trap, <clears throat> you have to really look hard for them in the trees and keep an eye on them um, constantly because if they get away from you in the organic, uh, you're never gonna be able to catch up. So when we get to indirect pests, and most of the time uh, in our farm, we just grit our teeth and hope for uh, hope for the uh, predators to come in and help us, because uh, we generally don't want to do anything to uh, to upset uh, natural uh, controls in the orchard. An example would be this uh, praying mantis, which is quite happy on a pepper plant here in our field. <clears throat> And our, our philosophy is we're trying to provide a good environment for the beneficial insects like the praying menace and uh, do what we can to make a bad home for the pests. 
And in our farm, we've seen a marked increase in predator species like the praying mantis, ladybugs, lacewings, predator wasps, uh, uh, predator mites. Uh, these are all uh, far more abundant than they were years ago with conventional agriculture. <clears throat> so the, the biggest uh, take home message here for the beneficials is they got to have something to eat. And so if you're using all kinds of inputs to try to, and this is what happens in conventional uh, agriculture, they maintain, uh, they just eliminate just about everything in the orchard that a predator can, can eat. And so they never have predator populations. And you gotta have a little bit of patience and you gotta tolerate some damage. There's a fine line though. Uh, how long do you wait for the predators to come in and, and rescue you from uh, the, the pests? And just a couple of years ago, we had a not for the first time when rust mite uh, populations built incredibly high in the orchard and before the predator mites could control them, they had made, turned our pear crop into a totally into a processor crop. So we, on our farm, we have just bit the bullet many times and not used products which we thought might harm beneficial insect populations. And uh, that were allowed to be used because they're a natural product, but we just don't use them to try to build predators. As far as uh, making a poor home for pests, uh, these uh, concepts are really doable. They're very doable. Uh, the one thing about predators, though, you don't really need a formal introduction. You just turn them loose in the orchard and uh, overwintering sites, uh, examples for those might be like a pile of wooden bins or firewood, or if you allow a, like a fire blight a canker to live in the tree over the winter, you're going to have trouble in the spring. So this, uh, this slide, I came across this slide and I, I just had this thought when I saw it that I just know that my grandpa and my dad would have said, well, boy, in my day, we wouldn't have used, had to use those rollers. Your generation is just soft, soft, soft. And anyway, uh, uh, there is a, uh, a school of thought that organic uh, practices are basically uh, turning their back and abandoning modern advances in agriculture. And I, I really... I see why people would say that, but I just do not agree at all with that. And uh, an example might be uh, my grandfather's struggle with a paracilla, which is a, a, a kind of an insect-like uh, organism that is specific to pears and it creates a, just a sticky mess of the crop and the trees, ends up uh, turning your crop into culls. And uh, grandpa just, spray you know they at the time conventional they just uh, agriculture they just sprayed everything that they could find on them and it would work for a year and then it wouldn't work and and the silla was just horrible just horrible uh, i remember that distinctly as a kid well now wsu has come up with a a program uh, about 30 years ago they came up with a program where you sprayed clay on the trees before bloom and i first when i first heard that i thought no come on really clay uh yeah, I thought somebody's really, really trying to sell us some snake oil here, but um, it works. It works really well. And as it turns out, Paracilla adults do not want to lay their precious eggs on a dirty branch because clay is just dirt, really. They don't want to lay their precious little young on a dirty branch. And I just cannot believe that a Scylla would be that picky, but apparently they are. I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, for me, it is the way forward. Uh, and I look at the slide and I think um, that um, the way forward is, is a lot like this, the last part of this climb. This is actually uh, Forbidden Peak in the North Cascades. And it's actually right next to a mountain called Mount Torment. So Forbidden Peak and Mount Torment, I think that we ventured into the area of the Lord of the Rings here for this climbing uh, mission, but anyway, um, there's off my brother's shoulder to the left, which you can't see is a couple thousand foot drop. And so uh, I just his body language tells me that um, 
he's wondering what the heck are we doing here? But um, this, uh, the way forward for organic agriculture is just like this cliff where there are handholds and footholds and they might not be super obvious and they might not be enough of them and for uh, to make it comfortable, but they're there. And we have to look for them. And if we do that, we can get to the top and we're not gonna conquer anything. We don't conquer mountains, we don't conquer nature, <clears throat> but we can learn to uh, move forward. So in the publicity for this uh, uh, presentation, they said something about you could learn the secrets of organic uh, food production. And I didn't think I was going to have to give up my secrets. But anyway, that took me more than 30 years to learn. But anyway, we're going to talk about that anyway. We're going to talk about the secrets. So basically, um, I think it's not really a secret, but really organic fruit, fruit production is anything but easy. And yeah, I know Ethan, he told me, Ethan said, Dad, I'm not paddling. I'm paddling. I'm not sailing here. But anyway, uh, organic ag agriculture to me is about looking for opportunities to work with uh, what nature gives us, because ultimately nature is way more powerful than anything we can do. And anybody who's lived for the couple, last couple of years with COVID and as the last couple of weeks with the winter uh, just has to conceive that nature is, is, is way beyond what we can control. And I think it's a 20th century, not a 21st, but a 20th century delusion that we can outsmart and outmaneuver nature. And to me, I, I love this slide because my brother in the back of this canoe, I think his body language gives him away again. And he's, he's thinking, well, this was a real good idea. Why are we here? So if, if uh, you know, at, Organic agriculture is definitely a challenge. Uh, it's more challenging than conventional, uh, for sure, because I've done both and I can, I can say that for sure. And also uh, with perennial uh, fruit uh, trees, it's a very committing uh, way of making a living and that you have committed to growing a perennial fruit. And if it goes wrong, then you're gonna be, it's, it's next year, you gotta, you, you've lost this year, you have to try again next year. And, just like climbing a, a, the north side of Mount Rainier is committing because there really may not be a way down that, the way you came up. You have to keep going up. So that's the same with, with uh, organic uh, fruit production. You, you are committed. Once you plant those trees and have started to bear fruit on them, you and, and their fate are linked together. And there are plenty of uh, ways that things can go wrong. And, uh, and I've been doing this for a while now and still every year there's things that come up that I have never seen before. And uh, Luke and Ethan think maybe I just haven't been paying attention. I, I don't know that that's been the case. I'd like to think I've been paying attention, but maybe I haven't, but still things come up that are new. And just like uh, walking along and all of a sudden you plunge through a snow bridge into a crevasse and you're wondering how the heck you're gonna get out of it. And uh, one thing I have learned, um, about farming is that no matter how bad things get, uh, they can always get worse. And this <laughs> is a picture of our very first shipment of organic Bartlett pears um, that went through the transition period and we were shipping the warehouse uh, trucker came and got them and we loaded the truck for him and he just zipped off before he tied down the load and it just fell off within a few feet. It just fell off. And uh, it's just incredibly heartbreaking. And the young man that's sitting on the truck there, uh, he, his name's Cody and he's now an actor in Hollywood. But anyway, he, uh, uh, you can just see it's written all over him that he just couldn't believe what he saw. And he asked me a few minutes after I took this photograph that, how did you, how do you, keep your calm when this kind of thing happens. And I, I just told him, I said, Cody, I've been doing this for a while and this kind of stuff, not this exact thing, but this kind of stuff happens all the time. And in, in organic uh, farming, there really are, the cavalry is not coming to the rescue. And uh, 
that we don't have rescue products like uh, conventional agriculture does. And in fact, conventional agriculture is kind of based on the fact that <clears throat> you wait for pests or diseases to start to become an issue. They're starting to get out of control and then you just spray something and take care of it. Well, you can't do that on organic. You have to be in front of it. Once it gets to the point where uh, you need a rescue product, it is over for this year. And SEAL Team 6 is not coming to get you. In fact, if you make the wrong decision or you fail to act in time, you're just gonna have to write it out. And I love this picture because I've always wanted to ask my brother, uh, and I wish I'd thought about it at the time, how's it going back there in the back of the canoe? How's it, how's it, is, how's it going back there? But the one thing you have to learn with uh, organic agriculture is patience because when things do go wrong, uh, it is next year. It's not like a lot of jobs where you have a bad day and you can fix it tomorrow or next week. It's next year. And that uh, lesson patience is really hard to take even though I've been doing it a long time, I still struggle with it. <clears throat> so you really have to enjoy what you're doing. I guess that's a lesson from that. And uh, one of the secrets and a good attitude uh, is just essential long hours. And when you're doing uh, agriculture requires you know, manual harvest of everything we grow. Uh, you just, you need people to have a good attitude and turn uh, what could be a hard uh, uh, slog into light work. And my dad and my grandfather, I had the privilege of picking for years in the orchard with them. And they, they just, they were just wonderful about that. They, they just everything, they just had a good attitude. They had, they made the hard, hard work, uh, light work. And to this, I will never forget some things about picking with them. And my grandfather, uh, we'd be picking these great big old cherry trees and without fail, before long, he'd end up picking them in the shade and I'd be picking in the sun and it'd be in the middle of August and it's hundred degrees. And when I catch him at it, he'd just laugh and laugh and laugh. He just, uh, he thought it was, uh, it was a game he played. And so we're out there working hard and, and my dad and my grandfather were the fastest pickers I've ever seen. And I've seen hundreds and hundreds of pickers now in, in my 60 years in the orchard. <clears throat> so Ethan in this picture, my son Ethan, he's applying a uh, bait, actually, actually working here. He's applying uh, a bait that controls a quarantine pest, the Western cherry fruit fly. And I told him, you're going to have to drive as fast as you can. He's got his, his hair on fire and he's enjoying every minute of it. Well, there's another picture uh, uh, with got my brother in it and the wind is howling so hard, I don't know what he's saying. I thought he was smiling, but I really started looking at that picture. I think he's grimacing. I think he's grimacing. Anyway, um, so you, you really have to enjoy these challenges. And in this particular situation, the wind was blasting us and uh, avalanches were coming down all over. And so what's not to like? And it's just a lot like farming. So in the end, um, to bring in a harvest, um, a big, beautiful, healthy fruit is, is, is really wonderful. And it does years of efforts. And Luke brought that up to me. So I said, I was gonna say it was a year long effort. He said, no, dad. He said, you, you had to plant these trees and you had to grow them until they start producing fruit. This took years to get here. And he's right. And you have to, I really enjoy the seasonal cycle of working towards, uh, you know, a harvest at the end and then seeing a, a year's effort come to fruition. And hopefully you have enough good crops and good years to keep you going. So true sustainability, I, sustainability gets thrown around a lot, I, you know, and everybody has their own definition. So we're gonna, I guess we're gonna talk about what I think about it for whatever that's worth. I personally, I just really, really dislike hearing people say something like, it's my land and I'll do what I want with it. And I, I just, I feel that's a very selfish, uh, self-centered and short-sighted, uh, and to me, almost comically ignorant statement because we are tenants on this land for a very short period in the scheme of things. And when we leave, we gotta have this, we gotta, our kids and our grandkids and their kids gotta be able to, uh, live off this land. So what we do here is so important. And <clears throat> uh, 
economic uh, viability is pretty straightforward. Social viability, what the heck is that? And uh, I guess to me, there's a couple parts there. One is pretty obvious in that it's in, in the environment we want to uh, keep uh, preserve the ability of, of our ground, ground to produce food for, well, forever. And then uh, the other part of that is uh, that we have to, hopefully the people that are actually on the farm can have a more balanced life for themselves and their family. And that to me is social viability. So in the end, you have to have a profitable crop. It's gotta be at least somewhat regularly profitable or you, it's just flat out not sustainable. And you've got to have, uh, sustainability has got to include the people, us as farmers being more than just cogs in the machine of production. You've got to enjoy life and the many wonders that are available if we can take the time and if we will take the time. And it's got to include uh, preserving the natural fertility, abundance and wonders of nature for our future generations. And, and I think we've reached the point in human history where this, must be a primary concern. And personally, when I think of my kids and grandkids, I'm hoping that my legacy will be for the better. And uh, I think uh, their agriculture got plenty of tough challenges and it's hard work and long hours, but uh, you need a good attitude and you need the ability to see the good things and temper the bad things with a little bit of humor. So I had a hired man that used to say this to me all the time. And when I said to you earlier that what I am presenting to you today, you have to take for whatever it's worth. And he used to say this to me continually, pretty much, well, with all that and $5, you can buy a cup of coffee, Cole. So anyway, thanks for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have if we have time. Thank you, Cole. That was great. Um, I know that there's going to be some questions out there. There's one um, here in the chat right now. And, um, and um, if people need to leave, they can. No, no, we won't be offended. <laughs> um, but we'll go on with some questions for a few more minutes anyway. Um, so here's a question is, and it is, is having a hard winter parentheses, cold, lots of snow that stays, a good thing for, for pest control? Having a hard winter generally is a good thing for pest control. The, the, the issue we have run into with a lot of snow is that uh, actually the metal voles, the mice, live quite uh, protected under that thick layer of snow and they will actually girdle the trees in the orchard. And the predators, so we have a lot of predators in our farm. We've got coyotes, we've got lots of birds of prey, we've got snakes, we've got weasels. Um, but the, under a deep snow, they, they just are having a good time down there without being exposed to predators. But other than that, the temperatures, uh, that's really good to get us off to a good start with pest and disease control. Do you go out and do anything like snow removal to help um, alleviate the vole issues? We, we don't. I mean, it's, it's just, okay. a, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. I don't know how much snow, how often you have a lot of snow standing. Well, uh, about, uh, I think it was about four or five years ago, we had a couple of feet for a couple of months and it, and we lost hundreds of trees, hundreds of trees. Okay, here's another question. Someone who's interested in um, having you talk more about how to prune apples at the bloom stage. I've tried to do it when the fruit is the size of a quarter. Are you mean thin or prune? Well, it says prune. Prune. But okay. potentially thinning might be part of the part of that. Yeah, yeah. thin. Thin is the question. Okay. Thin, okay. Um, you can do it at that stage. Generally, if you want to affect uh, the return bloom for the following year, you would want to do it uh, be within 30 days of bloom. So after 30 days, you aren't really going to affect your uh, return bloom very much. You can still uh, help your leaf to fruit ratio. 
what we generally would do is make sure we don't have more than one fruit on any one spur. And we need, you need to have three or four inches at least between, um, in all directions, between uh, the fruit that's a quarter size. So if there's two spurs that are right next to each other, each one has fruit on it, then you'd wanna take all the fruit off one of the spurs and leave one on the, on the, uh, on the second spur. So it's really hard. Sometimes it's unbelievable how much fruit we put on the ground thinning when we hand thin. It's just, it's, it's scary. But really, you have to remember, you only need about 5%. When you have a good, good bloom on the trees, you only need about 5% of those flowers to produce fruit to have a good crop. Okay. And to be clear, when you've mentioned 30 days, was that 30 days from flowering? Or what was the start of the 30-day period? Say, yeah, you could probably say from fruit set. But I, I think okay. that, in the, you know, we generally consider when we've got full bloom. Okay. Which would be, you know, full bloom would be all the king blooms open. Okay. Here's another question. What kind of cover do you maintain on your orchard floor? Well, uh, we uh, we had a, for years, we had a, a very short growing orchard grass. And then, uh, but when we started going, putting on composted, a chicken manure for a fertilizer, we need to rototill that in. So <clears throat> you rototill that cover crop up every year. So basically we have whatever comes back. If you rototill and mow year after year, you will get things that will tolerate that. And generally it's grasses, but there's other things, other perennials that do all right like that, but are mainly we have grass. Have you um, planted cover crops in there or was it always just kind of what came up? Well, that was, uh, we originally did plant a specific uh, cover crop. Um, when grandpa first started the orchard, it was irrigated with ditches. So open ditches. So uh, we couldn't have any cover crop in there. It had to be clean cultivated. But uh, once we went into 1980, we put in under tree sprinklers and then we could plant, actually plant a grass that was a low growing grass. It didn't use much fertilizer, didn't need to be mowed much. Uh, and it was good for, uh, you know, we didn't have blowing dust or washing dirt. It was good for holding the ground there. But once we started, like I said, once we started rototilling, that disappeared and we had whatever managed to keep itself propagating there. We did not replant anything in there because we kept uh, filling it up every spring or every okay. fall when we were fertilized. Okay. Here's a, um, a pest management question specifically about for cherries. What do you recommend for cherry maggot in the home orchard? Cherry fruit fly, uh, it, western cherry fruit fly, uh, that's probably, uh, it's pretty common even in, in uh, the Palouse and in the Coeur d'Alene area. And there is actually a really good control method for that. It really works even in a backyard situation. And that is, there's a product called um, spinosad. It's a natural, it's a bioinsecticide. The, the chemical name uh, that is spinosad. And it comes from, a, it's made by, a, naturally made by an organism. And it's some kind of bizarre organisms like an autofungus and it's not a bacteria or something like that. But um, and you may, it comes in, we use a product called a GF120, Naturalite GF120, and it's, it's like 99% probably molasses is what I guess it's in there. It sure smells like molasses and it pours like molasses. And there's just a tiny bit of spinosad in there. And you can put it in a, dilute it to four to one and actually put it in a, in a squirt bottle, uh, like a, you know, you would get to for cleaning fluid or something like that, but get a clean one that's not been used for that before and put that uh, diluted mixture, the four to one dilution and just spray a stream of it in different parts of the orchard as high in the trees you can get it. And the best thing, one thing that's really important is to try to keep your tree low enough that you can actually do that. So cherry trees tend to grow really tall if they're not on dwarf and rootstock. They can get to 35 or 40 feet tall and everything you can't really do anything about up there. So you have pests and birds and everything going crazy up there in the top. So you need to keep them pruned to where you can actually have some kind of control there. And that uh, that's one thing to look for. They may actually sell the bait um, or you may um, 
Um, well, I would check with that with the garden store people because uh, I wouldn't be surprised whether they'd carry it or be able to get it. <clears throat> okay, uh, different direction here, and this is from Brad. Have you tried any nut species or have any thoughts about nuts in our area? Yeah, we actually have a couple of walnut trees that uh, <laughs> my grandpa planted in back in the 60s and they produce nuts. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, so they do grow there, uh, and even though uh, years ago they said you couldn't grow walnuts where we grow well, we have neighbors that are growing almonds, and, and they're commercially, and uh, there's also hazelnuts growing around us. We uh, um, are not sure about doing that. Uh, the thing we've been concerned about is some people are allergic to nuts and we're afraid about mixing them in with our other products. So there's, we're still considering how to handle that. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Um, let's see, there's a, a note in the in the chat for those of you who might not see that, that there's a brand of spinosa at a building supply in Moscow called Jack's Dead Bug. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, spinosa is, yeah, spinosa is a, a very good um, broad spectrum um, um, insecticide, bioinsecticide. I, I, that's one of those things where you we use very judicious judiciously because we don't want to affect our predators but if you have a situation that's getting out of hand then it does work on, on several things it doesn't uh work on everything and i think it needs you need to be careful not to use too much of it because uh, we're afraid you know it, resistance could be built to that and like it has been to almost any other thing that's been used over the years and that, that, that I, I would just gather from the name it's probably not the bait but it maybe could be used as a bait too. So the bait, you want droplets of it, solid droplets. You don't want to have a mist. And then it's actually an attract and kill where the, the uh, fruit fly will actually go to that drop of bait and he'll start feeding on the molasses and he gets a tiny bit of spinosa and that's enough to take him out. Okay. And it's a very, very safe, uh, very low mammalian toxicity. It's uh, so it's a really, uh, uh, one of the few real silver bullets we have in organic agriculture. Okay. Well, that's all the questions that I see um, in the chat. I don't know if anyone else has any more and hasn't figured out the chat or wants to unmute themselves and ask, but I think we're um, well past our hour. Um, so I think we can probably say thank you and it was really great to have um, you present to us and we have this recorded. So if everything works out, we'll be sending out a link to the recording if you have a family member that couldn't see it or anything like that, but um, it'll be available and eventually be linked on our um, the Rural Roots website as well. And there's a number of comments